Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, Felician College, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Investors Bank. United Water. Making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. Verizon Communications. And by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. You want to meet a guy who runs one of the greatest theaters in this country? There he is right there. Thank you, thank you. He's a, well, let me introduce oh, you. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Adam go ahead. Adam Phillipson, president and CEO of Count Basie Theater in beautiful Red Bank, New Jersey. Tony Bennett said what? He said it was his favorite place to play. And you guys have had Bruce Springsteen come down and raise money, and the other guy, what's his name? We've had, uh, we've had John Bon Jovi. Yeah, the there. other guy, we've John Bon Jovi. Why does everybody love your place? You know, I mean, first of all, it's uh, it's historic. Everyone has a, everyone has a Count Basie story. Before the Basie, it was called the Carlton. It was the movie theater, uh, Walter Reed, and uh, you know, everyone has their first story. They have their first I saw a movie, their first kiss in the balcony. They have their first concert that they saw, and so all of these guys that that grew up in in the music industry and and became stars, you know, they still have a homegrown feeling. And the Count Basie connection. I mean, Count Basie from well, Count Basie was from Red Bank. So he, uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the 80s, they decided when they, when they resurrected the building, it was about to be under the wrecking ball. And uh, it was bought by the Monmouth County Arts Council. And then it was just about going through a name change. And someone came out with some money. And the Basie Trust came on board. And, and it became the Count Basie Theater. You guys are a quote unquote nonprofit. We are. Explain that to folks because people think, oh, you're a charity. Yeah, well, we, <laughs> which is great because, you know, sometimes it's confusing that we are that because ticket prices are high for some of the shows that we have. And, and so you have to realize, run an operation. Absolutely. And you don't realize that, that we are a fundraising organization, that we need support, that we do major outreach, uh, education and outreach in the schools, that we provide uh, all kinds of programming and scholarships for kids that get to come to the theater. Uh, so these are all sort of the mission-based things, and, and we have a mission. So we have a board of trustees and directors that, that govern and, and support the building and uh, make sure that it's running effectively. Of course, the staff take care of all the operations mm -hmm. that need to happen and the programming. But, uh, you know, we are fundraising. We, we need to keep this building alive. There's no, there's no city that's paying for it. This is a, its own entity that's paying for it. So part of what we do is raise the funds to be able to keep it open. You have something called the Performing Arts Academy. What is that? We do. So, well, uh, we, we, do, we have a pretty big commitment to, to the community. And then people can come and take classes uh, at the theater, uh, whether it's music and dance, uh, theater, and then we also have nonprofit uh, partnerships that we have with Rocket at the Basie and Jazz, where you can actually go and learn jazz and learn how to become a future rock star. How'd you get into this? Oh man, well, I have a, uh, a theater background, and somewhere uh, I was out in California. Actually, I'm from I'm from New, uh, New York, raised in New Jersey, and then uh, and then in the city, but moved out to to California. And somewhere around, I don't know, the early 90s, I was thinking I needed to transition out and sort of move into producing and theater management and, and fell into this incredible profession that's called arts management, which really had no idea about. And I got my master's in that and, and have been working one theater after the next, opening theaters uh, in California and, then, uh, and now here. What do you love about that? About, about the arts? Uh, not just about the arts, but theater management, which is not... See, the arts is one thing. Totally. Theater management, I mean... I love interviewing people, yeah. but broadcasting management is another story well, because we run yeah. a production company that has to pay the, for the lights and the incredibly talented people. You like that, guys? <laughs> nice. I wasn't talking about you. No, I was talking <laughs> about the guys here, people in the control room, the advertising, the marketing, and the whole bit. We run a business. That's exactly and it. I, and if it doesn't work, who's responsible? Uh, and me, you're responsible and you. on your end. Absolutely. That's not doing television interviews. 
That's not being in the arts per se. That's business management. You're right? totally right. I mean, my, my degree is a, is a uh, organizational management, Your leadership, <laughs> how you move a community, how you move people together, how you get people focused around a vision, a business plan. I mean, all of that. It's all the basics of business. It's oh, just it's not arts. Well, you know, it's 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 show <laughs> business, isn't it? Show business. business. Al Green said that. Not, not, what did I say? I was just telling you guys in the um, in the movie about James James Brown. Yeah. He said they said, listen, you just do the show, we'll do the business. That's and he exactly said, no. It. I want the show and the business. You love both pieces. I do, actually do. I mean, I, I think my theater background helps in terms of really being able to connect and understand that there's that you're trying to take an audience through something. I mean, you're taking somebody from the minute they buy a ticket to the minute they leave. That's how I focus. It's that arc. It's that seamless experience that you want somebody to have. You know, and, and that's when you can change someone's life. You know, they're sitting in there, they see something. You, you know, you remember a show where something magical happened, a concert where someone sang. We had uh, Stephen Van Zandt jumped on stage and played with our Rocket Kids and, uh, you know, was singing with them, and you know, I don't think the that great he's. Stephen Van Zandt. Well, yeah, I don't think exactly, and I don't think he East shared many microphones with anyone except maybe maybe Bruce. And there he was with one of our students. You know, that's a memory that that the child will never forget. But I think anyone even watching it, you'll never forget that. You got me thinking about um, <clears throat> how much you think about the experience for those who are there at the Count Basie Theater. I want to ask you this. I told you we had this initiative called Lessons in Leadership, where I'm uh, asking those who run organizations, not just CEOs of corporations, but CEOs of nonprofits as well, universities, others. Mm -hmm. What would you say the most important lesson in leadership you've learned at the uh, Count Basie Theater and in other positions you've had yeah. in theater management is? You know, I mean, Count Basie Theater, is, when you enter into an organization that has a huge reputation, I think for me as a leader, what I tried to do when I got there, and it's been about two and a half years, was just listen. You know, I wasn't, I'm not a guy that walked in there and was like, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I mean, I had my own ideas and creative ideas, but it was listening. What did the community want? What, what did the staff want? Who, the people who have been there forever, the donors, the, the artists, what, what's needed? You know, and that, so listening is, it was, it was a huge piece. But I think overall, you know, my experience in the theaters that I've run, I've always tried to approach my leadership style as, I mean, I think I'm a transformational leader. I try to get in with a great vision and, and then have that nonstop inspiration to get people motivated to, to get behind it. But I, I always think of somebody that, you know, my job as equally as you're going to help me get to where we need to get to is how can I help you get to where you need to get to. And if I tr treat each of the employees that work there in that manner, I, I find that people will, will do anything for you. Good stuff. Before I let you out, Project FX Project is? Project FX. It, that is, a, uh, the, uh, I believe, one of the first... Uh, youth film festivals. We're going to be having a, a high school winner and a college university winner in a student film festival. Uh, Tom Bernard, uh, Sony Pictures Classics, who's on our board, has been helpful, and, and Bank of America have been, been instrumental in Good getting people. this off the ground. Oh, it, listen, the winner of this festival uh, gets an internship with Sony Pictures in, in the city. It's, it's fantastic. You're doing great stuff. Thank Adam uh, Phillipson, President and CEO of the Count Basie Theater, Tony Bennett, the great Tony Bennett was right. He says it's his favorite place with good reason. Thank you, Adam. We appreciate it. Thanks for having Keep me. Keep up the good work. Appreciate one -on -one it. One-on-one will continue right after this. Stay with us. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Robin Goodman, who is executive producer of Bucks County Playhouse, America's most famous summer theater. Who said yes. that? The world. The world. Now, why? <laughs> and by the way, opened in 1939, is that true? Yes. Yes, 38 Thanks. or 39. Yeah. What's the deal with this big, iconic place? You know, I think it's because it's set in the most beautiful place in the world. It's on the Delaware River. It's in this beautiful town. The whole area is, you know, filled with gorgeous houses and mm -hmm. beautiful places. And uh, it, it's got shops and restaurants. And it developed, it started like a Hamptons kind of place. Oscar Hammerstein moved there, Moss Hart, George Kaufman. And it was like an influx of artists. So uh, they found this old mill that was about to be uh, pulled down, and it was right on the river. And they said, let's do some theater out here and encourage new work and do our shows and do other people's shows. Now, anyone famous ever play 
at this theater? Oh, yes. Such as? Such as Grace Kelly. No. Uh, yes, Helen Hayes. Now you're going to say Robert Redford. Ro <laughs> <laughs> you read my bio. Uh, Robert Redford did a play called Nobody Loves Me, which went to Broadway and became Barefoot in the Park. Wow. Yes. Dick Van Dyke? Dick Van Dyke. Are we looking at right now? Oh, that's yes, wild. that's right. And Thornton Wilder starred in Our Town as the stage manager just because he wanted to see what was wrong with the play, what wasn't working. Is that interesting, the connection between the theater and your place um, and Broadway? Yes. Is well, that the... It, it, well, they, they wanted to experiment, but they were such talented artists that, artists that were going, even Bob Fosse was out there at one point. Is that true? That it was, yes, that it was inevitable that things would move. Like when Jed Bernstein uh, took over the theater, he did a play with Tyne Daly called Mothers and Sons that moved to Broadway, and we're hoping at some point the same thing will happen for us. But that's what it was started for, to, to do new work. You know, what's so interesting is that you had this incredible, it's very impressive background. Um, now, on Broadway, connection to Cinderella? Yes, Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella, yes. Your connection is? I developed it with the Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, Foundation. Stop and bragging. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, okay, so you got this. So I got a new book writer for it, is what I did. So look at this. You got that, yes. right? Yes. So you've got the Broadway connection. Yes. But you've got this connection, right, with your yes. friends over at the Bucks County Playhouse. Correct. Give us the biggest difference. Well, the Bucks County Playhouse is a not-for-profit organization. We live on donations. But you're running a business. And we're running a business, yes, absolutely. The difference, I don't think there is a difference. We want to do high-quality theater, like our subscription series for this summer. We're trying to get the best sure. directors and artists in there that we possibly can. Last summer we had Chris Durang in his own play with Mary Lou Henner. And Marsha Mason was in a play. Great people. Yeah, and Hunter Foster, who's a Broadway actor, director, is directing for us. It's not like the standards are lower. No way. No way. I won't allow it. I just won't allow it. We, we are doing the best work we can there for this community. We want to become the center, the artistic home of this community. Uh, we're very involved, actually, with the schools. And we, you know, we have an education program that's wonderful. Hester Kamen runs, and it's, it does all kinds of things for teenagers. What's Girl Speak? Girl Speaks, my favorite program. Thank you. What's it all about? Uh, it's about letting girls, teenage, young teenage girls and preteen girls, talk about the issues that are concerning them. What does and, that have to do with theater? Well, because we turn them into theatrical events. We turn them into monologues and, and little plays and uh, ways of expressing themselves so that they can discuss it with each other and they can sort of liberate their feelings about what's going on. Because, you know, girls are getting harassed at that age all the time mm -hmm. with different kinds of pressures and and boys and all that stuff that bullying, you do. Bullying, cyberbullying. Bullying, cyberbullying. Somebody was just telling me outside about her daughter being cyberbullied. It's terrible. It's very real. Girls yes. need that platform. There's no I'm question. I'm curious about this. Um, other than the fact that uh, at your playhouse, new works are important, right? Yes. You know, How do you do that? We started something called the Oscar Hammerstein Festival with the Hammerstein, the Oscar Hammerstein, Hammerstein, Hammerstein Festival. Festival with the Hammerstein family. Uh, where we're developing new musicals because my career in New York is starting with Avenue Q and in the Heights has mostly been about developing new musicals and so we're doing it out there now and we did the first two where it's a mentorship program where we bring in <coughs> professionals and they work with these emerging writers who are working on their new mu musicals and we do panels and readings and and we're still working on the first two and we're going to have another festival in the fall and it's fun for the people in the mm. community because they, they're interested in see how things change and get better, and it's a long process developing musicals. Trick question. Yes. Ready for it? Yeah. When did you know? When did I know? When uh, did you know theater would be your My life? mother was an actress <laughs> on radio and a writer. On no. The, on the Skippy Peanut Butter Hour. And she wanted to be in the theater more than anything. And then she had married my dad, and the war came, and he had, she had to have a baby, and she had to give it up. And so she took me to the theater when I was four and a half years old. Do you, do you remember? Royal Shakespeare Company doing, uh, I can't remember, oh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And I fell in love. Did and you I, fall in love with? Those people on the stage, the facts that they were expressing feelings and, and doing things that were larger than life and also being loved. I think people who go into the theater really want to be loved. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, seriously? I seriously do. And, and be knew, heard. And be heard. And you knew that theater would be? Uh, yes. I, wanted, I came to New York as an actress, actually. And it's a great way to become a producer. Final question. Um, some folks say, well, you're in New York. You're doing great stuff. 
come out to Bucks County for the Bucks County Playhouse. Why make the move from New York to Bucks County? Because I can do, like we can do a season out there that starts with a musical called National Pastime. We can do a brand new musical called a Animal Crackers. We can do a play. Uh, we can do a whole season of plays, which we're selling right now, by the way. And we can do it for a tenth of the price. We can do great work out there. It's a beautiful theater. It's a beautiful stage. The renovation is impeccable. And I don't have to worry about all the union issues and all the costs that doing Broadway. It costs $13 million to do Cinderella. It would probably cost $175,000, $200,000 to do a musical out there. i got to ask you this one. Yes. I don't know if you hear me ask our last guest what's the most important. What is the most important leadership lesson you have learned in all of your work? I think it's very important to let the people you hire do their jobs and that you keep your eye on the big picture. And I also believe you always tell the truth and you always show up for the hard stuff. Tell the truth even when it hurts people. Yes, kindness. Kindness is very important. And when you fire somebody, you have to be kind and, and compassionate about it, as well as when you congratulate someone. Good stuff, great advice. And we wish you nothing but the best. Robin Thank you. Goodman, executive producer. Come. To the Bucks <laughs> County Playhouse. It's America's be most famous summer theater. Uh, weekday, weekend, when, what? Come anything? all the time. We play all week, uh, weekends, uh, matinees, Sundays, Saturdays. Tell everyone where it is. Oh, it's, uh, it's right in the center of New Hope, Pennsylvania. Right by the, what's the bridge right there? That's called the uh, Lambertsville. And what, Lambertville's on one side, right? New Jersey. And New Hope is and on the other. And New Hope's other. on the Pennsylvania yeah, side. And the Delaware River is gorgeous. And what's the, the festival over there with the fish? I don't the know. Chat, the Chat the chat Festival. Oh, I, I've never been to See, that. See, I know these things. I've only been there a year. Okay, it's beautiful stuff. <laughs> it is. I uh, wish you nothing but the best, Robin. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad that New York lost you. We got you. Thanks. Uh, stay with us. <laughs> right back right after this. Thank you very much. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to welcome Jennifer Nersessian, Superintendent, Gateway National Recreation Area. We're talking about uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Yes. And uh, also, what's Fort Hancock? Uh, Fort Hancock is the National Historic Landmark District that actually makes up the whole of the peninsula at Sandy Hook. It's, it, the history out there is amazing. I mean, most people know Sandy Hook because they're going out there to the beach to enjoy the summer fun. There's lots of activities there, but the history, the military history stretches back all the way to the Revolutionary War. Military it, history? Yeah, Explain absolutely. That. I was looking at pictures, go ahead. Uh, it's a military outpost. Um, back in the Revolutionary War, it was a loyalist outpost until the end of the war. Um, was significant through the Civil War, War of 1812, in World War II, there were about 10,000 people living out there. Mm. Uh, it was the first place, actually, in the country where we had women stationed at a fighting installation during World War II. And it was still active all the way up through uh, the Cold War. We have a Nike missile site there. And all of this, um, we still have the buildings, a lot of the historic architecture and features that we uh, have there to interpret for the public. What condition? is uh, Sandy Hook and the Fort Inn. Let, let's describe what's really going on there, because post-Sandy, a lot of negative things happened. Well, Sandy, of course, was a challenge for us, like it was for everybody else along the shore. Um, we're still working on recovery. I mean, after the hurricane, we came in, did the emergency work. Got, you know, there was four to eight feet of sand on the roads. There was 13 feet of water in some places that took weeks and weeks to recede. You know, no power, no utilities. Um, and a lot of the infrastructure was seriously damaged. Uh, we took care of the immediate needs, got the roads open, got the beaches back open by May of 2013. Um, but we're still working on things like um, getting the visitor center mm. taken care of, uh, the history house back open. Why is all that Our, matter? Why do you need to get that history house open? Sorry for interrupting, Jennifer. That's okay. It's important people understand why it's not enough to open the beach and that's it. Why is the rest of it, the historical part of it, so important? Because this is part of who we are as a country. Um, understanding where we came from, from what we went through, 
uh, the significance of this place and the pieces of history it tied to that shaped who we are as a people, that matters. It helps us know ourselves and know our country. Uh, it's important for us as a community, as a state, um, and as citizens of the United States to, to understand the significance of that and to have the opportunity to connect with it. And not just reading about it in a book or learning a history lesson, but to be out there and see what it felt like to, you know, see these beautiful houses or the amazing old gun batteries mm. uh, and, and the folks that come out to help interpret these. I mean, real living really history. Uh, to help bring those stories alive for the public that are in period costume and really know the history and, and bring that to life. But to understand it in its context, to see the views out to the ocean of New York Harbor and understand why this was such a significant place in the protection of New York Harbor, to smell the salt air and know what it felt like to be a soldier out there or somebody throughout that, that but time But Jennifer, this, this does not happen uh, without dollars. Let's talk about what it cost to renovate some of these buildings and the role the public can play in helping in that effort. Yeah, so it is a big challenge. Um, we need to do a lot of work on the buildings out there. They are beautiful buildings, gorgeous. Old officers' quarters, officers' clubs, barracks buildings, I mean, stunning. And all with this tremendous ocean view. But they need infrastructure work. And historic preservation does not come, come cheaply. Uh, and really, the best way to preserve something for the long term is to have somebody in it using it in their day in and day I mean, out and someone there? who living there or using it for an office or a business and so we're looking for public private partnerships people who can help us invest in the restoration of these buildings in exchange for a long-term lease and being able to use the building so uh, i want to understand this what you're saying is part of the plan mm -hmm. in this area in, in this whole sandy hook area is to have so give us a for instance say a law firm Mm -hmm. for argument's sake, a law firm wanted to be a part of this. And they said, you know, we're going to renovate that building. Yeah. The potential exists for that law firm to set up their operation in that building, and what would they get, potentially? In exchange for all of the money that they invested into the restoration of the building, that money would come off any lease payments that they would ex be expected to pay. So essentially, for all the money they invested, they would get to use the building for free um, for up to a term of 60 years. We actually have six requests for proposals out on the streets right now. They're due April 16th. Two for bed and breakfast, two for a residence or office use, and two for nonprofits. Now, take a step back. <clears throat> Unlike, well, listen, there, there are regulations and governments involved in, in a lot of these efforts, but particularly here, being consistent or, or having whatever work is done, being consistent with historic preservation requirements and specs is critical, right? Yes, it's, it's absolutely critical. Talk about that. And anybody who comes in to do this work, we will work with them to make sure that we're meeting those requirements. They have to meet the, the Secretary of Interior's standards for historic preservation to make sure we're maintaining that look and feel of these really significant and when structures were they built? for the. Uh, Describe this they range the from like the late 1800s to uh, early 1900s in that period. Why do you care so much about this? You personally? Me personally? How did well, you get into this whole thing and why do you care so much? I grew up in New Jersey. Grew Where? up. Uh, I grew up in Bergen County. Then I went to Rutgers, uh, both as an undergrad and a graduate, and spent many years around Central Jersey. And used to come to Sandy Hook just for fun. Uh, started coming for the beach. Um, got into nature. The bird watching at Sandy Hook is phenomenal. It's a really significant migration spot uh, for the Eastern Flyway. That northern facing peninsula is a really unique feature and makes it bird a tremendous watching? place to go see birds. Recognized across the country for this? Nationally and internationally. Really? Yes. So you um, got into this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, how does it become a career? Uh, you know, I, I took stock, looked at, you know, what I liked doing, what was important to me, and it, and it was these special places and making sure that they were uh, available to everybody. I mean, I think the other important component that's important to me personally is community and connecting these things with people and the, the experiences I've had and the opportunities I've had, making sure that other people have those same opportunities because they're phenomenal places, phenomenal resources, and they can be transformative, life-changing. And you know, I want to share that with people. And 
It's a way to help build community at the same time, which I think is also such an important component of what we're trying to do at Sandy Hook. It's not just, it's not just about these buildings themselves. It's about the community we're building out there and the process of mm. bringing them back to life. You know, people use the term national parks. Mm -hmm. I do, and I often say, oh, it's a beautiful national park. Yeah. But I, don't, I haven't given much thought until we were getting ready for this segment as to what a national park is. What is a national park and why do they matter so much? It's something that is one of a kind or the best or most superlative example of what it represents, be it, you know, amazing natural features, cliffs and waterfalls, to significant moments in history that shaped who we are as a country, uh, to just phenomenal recreational experiences, the chance to get outside and move, especially uh, in a really densely populated region, region like we have here. I mean, this amount of open space and the sense of remoteness you can get out at Sandy Hook, but right near so many communities is, is pretty amazing. And finally, uh, in the few minutes, a few seconds we have left, for people who want to come down to Sandy Hook or are watching in a, in a broad uh, multi-state region, tell everyone where it is. Because I don't want to assume everyone knows because we're Jersey yeah. people. We know that it's exit 117. That's right, off the Garden State Parkway. Off the parkway. Isn't it ridiculous how we know things from the exits? Yeah. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, exit 117 off the parkway. Uh, <laughs> it's in Middletown Township, so just follow the road straight out to the shore and you'll hit it. And it tells us exactly where to go. Yeah. And uh, you're proud to wear that uniform. We're Absolutely. proud to have you here. Thank uh, you. Jennifer Nersessian, mm -hmm. Superintendent. Yes. Yeah, Gateway National Recreation Area, mm -hmm. Sandy Hook, and also Fort Hancock. I want to thank you for joining us and telling us about the important national significance and why uh, all of us need to care. Thank you very thank much. Thank you Jennifer. very much. It was great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, Felician College, Qualcare, Inc., Investors Bank, United Water, Verizon Communications, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.